This conference will now be recorded. Great. Okay. Well, Doug, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christine. Thanks, Joanne, for bringing it up. Joanne's going to control the PowerPoint presentation for me here. Um, so I want to. Uh, thank everyone for getting on today onto this webinar. Um, we're happy as CPSE to talk about what we do, um, which is extended producer responsibility and product stewardship. And so I'm going to cover that in some fairly decent level of detail. And then um, Joanne's going to talk more specifically about a couple of solar panel uh, recycling piloting projects we're doing in California. So, um, so Joanne, next slide, please. We're a scrappy little uh, staff of five folks uh, that are doing this work, and um, we are governed by a 14-member board. Um, next slide. As you can see, we have quite a diverse board. Um, most of our local uh, city and county or JPA representatives um, that uh, bring a lot of great expertise to our organization and help guide myself and the staff on what we do um, on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be just in projects or in uh, legislation. Next. Matter of fact, I should I was I was remiss in saying pointing out that Christine was is one of our board members, <laughs> and so as you saw her picture there, um, I always like to uh, thank our funders because without our funding, our funders, we would not be able to do what we do. So we have a lot of cities, counties, districts, and JPAs that contribute annually to us. We greatly appreciate that. We have um, sponsors at various levels. Recology, Christine's organization, is one of our platinum sponsors. Um, we're always looking for other sponsors that could fill those roles under the various medals that you see there. Um, I know it's a tough time right now with COVID. We understand, and the economy is just uh, has tanked as a result. If there's any opportunity for you to um, become a sponsor, we would love it. We also recognize that we have a reciprocal agreement with our uh, with our friends over at CRA, and so we appreciate that relationship we have with them as well. Next slide. So, what does CP what does CPSC really do? We're here to try and get the manufacturers of the products that we buy every day in the in the stores or out in the market um, to take those products back at the end of life and assume the cost of that end of life management of those because right now we're more of a well let's have the local government and ratepayers pay for the end of life costs so the manufacturers don't, really don't care what it costs to get rid of it at the end of life so but when we shift that responsibility to them and that cost burden to them they start to change their ways. They start to rethink about how they design their products because we want them to redesign them to be more durable, more repairable, more um, reusable, and then also um, more recyclable so that we have less of, of these materials going into landfill or going to household hazardous waste, which is an even much more expensive thing just going to landfill. Uh, next slide. So we are all about a cradle to cradle system. So again, we right now, a lot of the products we get are cradle to grave and they end up in a landfill or a waste energy facility. Um, so we're trying to shift that paradigm to have materials that are products that are made. And then when they're, they reach their end of their useful life, they are um, disassembled, uh, separate out into their various components, materials, and then uh, those materials are reused to make new products, whether it be the same new products or other new products. But at least we've got a circular, um, circular kind of an economy going where that those materials are reused over and over again, rather than just going to for one time use and then going to landfill. Next slide. So there are a couple different types of stewardship. There's product stewardship, uh, which I'm going to get into in some detail. Uh, but that's usually voluntary or mandatory. Uh, it depends on what it is. Um, it usually involves a visible fee. So, for example, carpet, mattresses, and paint um, are what I would call product stewardship programs. They Because we as consumers pay fees, which I'll get into in some detail later in the presentation. But we pay those fees at the check stand when we buy these products. And that money is used to fund the programs to recycle those, those products. Um, it does require quite a bit of oversight 
And so um, that can be costly as well. Or we can go towards more of an extended producer responsibility, or you'll hear me call it EPR on a regular basis, an EPR type of model. This one is usually mandatory because um, most manufacturers don't want to do EPR. They don't want to pay for that. They would rather see someone else do it. And so it's rare that it's gonna be voluntary. Um, we assume that those costs to run that program are embedded into the price of the product, but certainly this, this makes the producers more aware of those costs. And so they're going to do everything they can to make those end of life costs as low as possible so that they don't have to reflect that in their ultimately in their uh, product price and compete with other products of, that might be the same that are doing bet, a better job and therefore could be even a cheaper on the market than themselves. Um, EPR programs tend to have a lot less uh, oversight because the reality is um, it's up to the manufacturers to make sure it's efficient, economical and uh, effective. Whereas with product stewardship, it's usually the reverse. We have to, uh, it's, at some, in some cases, we have to really make sure that the program operators are actually operating the programs as efficiently and effectively as possible. Next slide. So here's a, a graphic I created a number of years ago to kind of lay out where our California programs lie that we have that are either EPR or product stewardship and where they lie in a kind of in a spectrum approach. And so on the far left, we have true extended producer responsibility. This is where, again, the, the producers or the manufacturers are paying for the end of life of costs. And so you got thermostats, ag, pesticide containers, recalled products. Recalled products is, um, a, a little bit more unique one because that is where if the product is bad the the uh, manufacturers have to stop selling those products and then they have to actually offer a way to take those back so it's a kind of a hybrid because it's got a uh, kind of a ban almost too in a sense because of the product if the product's being recalled um, and then pharmaceutical and sharps this was a bill that cpsc sponsored in 2018 they got through the legislature to require the pharmaceutical industry and the sharps industry to provide uh, take back um, options for their customers and it's mandatory. So um, on the far right of the spectrum, we have one pound propane cylinders. So right now this is, the reason this is not EPR is because the propane manufacturers, the propane cylinder manufacturers are not paying for this. So it is really a product stewardship, but it's a it's a voluntary one right now. No, there's no legislation forcing uh, the propane uh, industry to provide these containers or manage, manage them. So this is um, one of those ones that is another outlier, uh, but a great program. Uh, CPSC owns and operates and maintains the Refuel Your Front Fun program, our campaign for reusable one pound cylinders. So if you'd like to visit our refuelyourfun.org uh, website, uh, you can get more, learn more information about the one pound refillable uh, propane cylinders. And then of course in the middle is Rechargeable batteries by call to recycle, the California bottle bill program, or we like to see the CRD program. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, carpet, paint, paint and mattresses. And then tires e and e-waste are managed by Cal Recycle, but they are still also product stewardship programs because we are paying for those programs at the check stand. Uh, next slide. So there are EPR and product stewardship laws all over the United States. This is a graphic that's been produced by Product Stewardship Institute back in 2019. Um, it probably is a little bit outdated. We've got more programs in place now. Uh, so California, while showing nine, that's almost more like nine plus, we actually have 11 programs uh, that are either EPR or product stewardship, uh, which you'll see in the next slide, and I'll go through them very briefly. But you can see we've got the majority of the list of the different programs that are across the United States we have here in California. The three at the bottom, the beverage containers, tires, and product recall that I show on the left with the arrows, uh, those are not on PSI's list, so I added those because those are programs of, of ours uh, that we are running here in California. Next slide. So as I mentioned, I was going to go over these in uh, brief detail. So in, in our spectrum of 11 different uh, EPR and product stewardship programs, we have the true EPR programs listed there, one through five. I've kind of covered them a little bit already. And then we have our product stewardship programs, which I've also covered. But I just wanted you to have a nice list of the various programs that are out there for our uh, 11 different EPR and product stewardship programs. And off to the right, you'll see 
um, logos of the various agencies or organizations that are monitoring or maintaining those various programs. Next slide. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go over some of these in detail. So let's talk about rechargeable batteries. Now, again, this was a uh, bill from 2008 the, from, uh, from Pavley, from member Pavley, and this was to require that rechargeable batteries be uh, returned, re collected and recycled. So it's the Rechargeable Recycling uh, Act. And so Culture Recycle runs this program on behalf of the, um, of the industry who's required to handle these. And so um, they provide boxes. You can get these boxes at their on their website, Culture Recycle, uh, for rechargeable batteries and cell phones. And um, they will take those back for free. Now, if you're going to do, um, because they have to, they're required to take them back for free. But if you're going to mix batteries, you're going to have alkaline batteries and other chemistries in there besides just the rechargeables. Then uh, they'll typically want to charge you for that. And those boxes, I show you a price that they have on their website right now for their large and small battery boxes um, that you can order from them. And they even have them in pallet uh, quantities as well for a discount. So you just have to check out their website. But again, so Call to Recycle is running that program on behalf of the industry. Next slide. Just to talk a little more about batteries, C CPSC is actually uh, partnering up uh, again this year with the Californians Against Waste organization and also the South Bay Side Waste Management Authority to try and deal with batteries uh, because they are a significant problem in our industry causing fires, especially the lithium ion batteries. And so we've been carrying legislation last year, AB uh, 1509, and we're moving it into this year to try and capture all of these batteries and uh, create a stewardship, a actually EPR program. So we will be pushing forward legislation that will be true EPR to have the battery industry create convenient collection systems to take these in and properly recycle them. Because as you can see, um, there are so many different looks to these batteries, so many different chemistries on this page that you see. How do we expect the consumers to figure this out and know what batteries go where, which ones can go into the call to recycle boxes for re rechargeables versus which ones can't? So the reality is we need a better solution. And that solution has got to be something that's easy for the consumer to understand or for the consumer to utilize. And so that means doing all Batteries. So we're our um, next slide, please. So, oh, yeah, next slide. There you go. So we're going to not only include all the loose household batteries that you just saw, but we're also going to be including rechargeable um, batteries that are uh, either detachable, and then we're also doing embedded. And so you'll, if you have batteries in your cell phone, example, or other devices, un, not laptops, whose laptops are covered under the Cal, under the e-waste program with CalRecycle. But if it's another, it's like a cell phone or some other embedded battery, it will be included in the program that we're working, the battery bill we're working on. But here again, here's a whole bunch of different types of batteries. These are the lithium ion batteries that are causing problems and are causing fires in our facilities, it, at uh, in MRFs, at landfills, or in collection trucks. Next slide. And then of course, this is just getting more and more complicated every day. Uh, we now have USB plug-in rechargeable batteries, and so um, <laughs> it's just going to get tougher for the for the uh, individual consumers to figure this out. And then, it, then when you look at a battery, uh, like I have in the lower left, you got a Duracell Ultra Ultra M3. I'm not sure what the chemistry is there, but it looks an awful lot like that Duracell lithium battery. So, which one's rechargeable, which one's not, or either of them rechargeable, or are they just single use? And so this is why it's such a complicated problem, and why we're we're tackling uh, batteries uh, so aggressively now to try and solve this problem before it gets worse. Next slide. Hey, Doug. Okay. Before you move on, uh, we did yes. have a question about batteries. Can you take that now? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so David Nightingale asked, have you ever seen any estimates for consumer batteries that establish a baseline so the collection recovery rate can be calculated? Um, yes, David, what I've seen is what's coming out of British Columbia in their model. There is, um, I think it was like three or four cents for each double, AAA and double AA. I'd have to bring up that table. I can respond to you offline on this. Um, but there, there is a way to certainly get the per battery. Now, to know exactly how many batteries are sold in California at any given year, I'm not sure we'd ever be able to get to that information um, without them being, them being the manufacturer being required to report to us or to somebody. 
But right now, as far as I know, I, I'm not sure of any data source that would tell me how many triple A's, double A's, um, and other types of batteries are sold into California. Is that, uh, is that it, Christina? And hopefully that open, answered David's question. Yep. Okay. All right, moving into ag pesticide containers. So um, this particular program is um, to allow for the ag industry to recycle their containers. And so I know uh, in my old job at Sacramento County, we used to take these in. We had we allowed um, the Department of Pesticide Regulation to have a, a collection location at our North Area Recovery Station. And we would see the, uh, something like this come in to our facility and take the triple rinsed uh, containers and grind them up into a, a uh, into that like that bag you see on the picture, and then haul that off, and that material would be uh, reused. So this is a great program. It's free to the pesticide um, to the agriculture industry. Uh, it's covered by uh, the, the industry itself, who sells the pesticides, um, and it's run by the uh, the DPR. And again, those those things have to be certified triple rinse before they can be processed into uh, granular plastic again. Next slide. Okay, and then we have mercury thermostats. This is another true EPR program where the thermostat industry um, is required to take back these uh, thermostats that still have mercury in them. Um, and these are still in a lot of households all over the United States and certainly here in California. Um, I know that the Thermostat Recycling Corporation provides boxes. So if you're running a household hazardous waste facility uh, in your jurisdiction, uh, you can certainly request one of these boxes and they will ship it out to you. When it's full, you just seal it up and ship it back to them and it's all free of charge. So this is another good program where the Thermostat industry has to take responsibility for the products they made in the past um, and they're funding that through their, their proceeds from the thermostats they sell today. Next slide. And then I mentioned earlier about uh, SB212 that's uh, CPSC sponsored in 2018. So um, in about the middle of 2022, you will see um, this program rolling out. Uh, the regulations were just submitted to the Office of Administrative Law and should be coming out any time now. They're supposed to be effective by January 1 of 2021. It'll be about a year and a half for the program will start being implemented full bore, but what it requires is it will require the pharmaceutical industry to pay for collection, medicine collection bins up and down the state, uh, five, a minimum of five in every county, um, a minimum of one for every 50,000 residents. And if they can't get five in a county, and they don't, um, then they have to have at least 10% of the, um, the chain pharmacies representing a, or hosting a bin. And so and this will all be free to the consumer. Uh, this program is going to be managed by pharma and whoever they choose as their stewardship organization and will be run by them and funded by them. <clears throat> the other side of uh, 212 is the um, Sharps manufacturers are required to, at the point of sale, provide a safe return container for every Sharp that is sold. So if they sell ship 50 Sharps, um, 50 needles, they have to provide a container with the capacity to handle all those or hold all those 50 sharps and it's going to be a mailback program they chose not to do collection kiosks they wanted to do mailback they they be in the industry the sharps industry and so they will be required also to start rolling out their program and providing these sharps containers free of charge at the point of sale if you want more information you can just go to the caliber cycle website um, my understanding is this presentation will be available after the webinar and so you can also follow these links they should be live and take you where you want to go uh, next slide okay then now we're starting to transition more into the uh, product stewardship kind of realm again with beverage containers so um, but this one's a little bit of a hybrid because the majority of it is actually product stewardship or a visible fee, which is basically the deposit, the five or, cents, tens, five or 10 cents that's charged at the point of sale, but that the consumer can get back through redemption centers. But there's also another part of this program, which is where the uh, beverage manufacturers are required to pay 
into the system for their choice of the materials they use to package their beverages. And so if they're using a low value HDPE container or maybe a polypropylene or polystyrene um, container, um, a densified polystyrene container, they're going to pay into the program um, to help subsidize the cost of recycle, the true cost of recycling of those those bottles. Typically, aluminum has got such a high salvage value that it does not have a uh, processing uh, payment requirement. But and uh, PET has fluctuated back and forth on whether or not it has um, a fee or not associated with it. The manufacturers pay, uh, and then of course, bottle uh, glass and HDP and the other plastics do have requirements to pay in uh, because they typically do not generate enough money on their salvage value to cover the true cost of recycling. So we've seen a significant loss in uh, redemption centers, 50% loss in redemption centers over the last three or four years um, due to closures, um, especially replanted when they closed, that was a significant loss. Um, the stores were put on the hook at that point, the big stores, uh, big box, you know, like Safeways, the grocery stores, anybody over $2 million in gross annual sales was put on the hook to actually provide redemption services. They don't get paid for that. Um, they have to actually return the deposit and we're not totally certain they actually get the money, but that deposit back. Um, a lot of the stores have chosen to just pay the hundred dollars per day fine. So $3,000 a month, it's cheaper than dealing with having to take back bottles and cans. Um, so there are, there's a large reserve in the in the fund right now in the beverage container fund uh, that could be used to kind of revamp the program, but it is got to be done. Most of the changes need to be done through legislation. There's always several bottle bills that are introduced each legislative session. Um, some make it through, some don't. Uh, there's there's a call to try and revamp the entire system, make it more like the organ model or something like that. But the problem with the organ model is that was set up bef uh, without payments to cities and counties. It was set up without payments to curbside programs. And so to try and bring that program, that Oregon program here into California, it's gonna be very tricky. Doesn't mean it can't be done, but there, it's not gonna look exactly like the Oregon model in order to preserve what's already there, preserve the existing recycling infrastructure we have. Uh, a lot, some of the funding that comes in from the CRV program funds the uh, single stream recycling and dual stream recycling programs. So we don't want to negatively affect those. So it's going to be tricky to uh, revamp the beverage container law. Next slide. All right, tires is another one. Uh, you get charged $1.75 currently at the point of sale when you buy new tires. They, the tire dealership or the tire um, a retailer who's changing your tires out may also charge you and I'll typically will charge you an additional charge. That could be two to four dollars per tire, uh, depending on what uh, dealer you're using and how much it costs them to get rid of the tire. So you're paying the dollar seventy five and that's to fund the tire recycling program and which typically results in grants and other types of funding mechanisms to try and get these tires recycled. But it's not enough to cover the, the cost of transportation and processing of the tires themselves at tire facilities. So therefore, um, you're gonna see a charge at the point of sale to, to just quote unquote dispose of your tire. Uh, most of them do go to recycling, but there are some that are going to landfill still. So there are grants available through the tire program. Um, you can go onto Cal Recycles website and go to their grant, their grants, tire grants pro, uh, page, and you can find out how you might be able to take advantage of the tire grant program, maybe for tire cleanup, tire, tire amnesty grants, tire cleanup grants, et cetera. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Next slide. All right, another um, product stewardship program is the e-waste program. This is also run by CalRecycle. Uh, this one is primarily funded right now through what is called the Covered Electronic Waste Program or CEW. We pay four to five or $6 per monitor at the point of sale when you buy a new TV, buy a new monitor for your computer you buy a laptop, anything with a four inch screen or larger gets charged one of those fees and it's, it's tiered based on the size of the screen you're buying. Um, that money goes into the e-waste fund to try to uh, allow CalRecycle to pay out to e-waste processors um, monies to run the program. Now, what's not covered in there, and you see in this picture, there are other devices there, the printers, the desktop PCs, uh, keyboards, mice, et cetera, those types of things are not covered by any fees right now. They're the universal uh, universal waste electronic devices, but they are they have no fee associated with them. And so these may or may not be getting recycled right now at your 
um, local solid waste facility or maybe your, even your e-waste facility if you have one close by. So those, a lot of those materials are ending up in the landfill um, unless a jurisdiction chooses to use some of the proceeds from the CEW program to cover the cost of that, uh, of these other products. Um, or they tend to use maybe tipping fees at the facility to help subsidize those costs of those products that don't have any coverage, any money coverage right now. So um, there are lots of collection programs out there. Again, you can do uh, collection events. Your e-waste processor may be able to set up an event for you if you don't have a facility nearby that's taking them or you want to get more of these products out of the waste stream. But again, uh, it really depends on what's going on with these. CPSC uh, will be working on a bill this year, which will include these products as well. These ones that are unfunded, we're looking to try and get some kind of funding behind these uh, in a true EPR kind of system. Don't We don't really necessarily want to expand the CEW program. Uh, we'd rather see the manufacturers of these products help pay for the cost of, of re recycling these products, getting them out of the waste stream. Um, and so we're looking to head in that direction. Next. So slide, please. Okay, and so as I just mentioned, here's those other products. You see there's a whole bunch of those different products that are not part of the CEW program. Vacuum cleaners, toasters, coffee makers, um, printers, faxes, et cetera. Those are the ones that we wanna help try and cover to get them recycled so they don't necessarily go to landfill. Um, they're legally, it's legal to landfill them in California right now unless they have, they're part of the universal waste program. Um, and if they have components in them like a microwave with a capacitor that needs to be removed before it can be landfilled. Next slide. Paint is another program. Now this one is a true product stewardship program. Here's where we as the general public are also paying into the program. We're paying 75 cents per gallon at the point of sale. Uh, or if you buy a five gallon container, you're paying a buck 60. Now Paint Care, who runs this program on behalf of the paint industry, is uh, does offer free transportation and recycling. Uh, this is available for retailers. It's available for HHW facilities. They have some cost structure for also if you want to recycle the paint yourself for reuse. And they have a great reuse program. They're funding the reuse quite well right nowadays to encourage reuse so they don't have to pay for the recycling of it uh, downstream. So if you want to know more information about paint care, if you're not a paint care, uh, location and you'd like to be and see if you can qualify to become one, uh, feel free to visit their website and inquire within about how how they're doing. Um, we look at these, this is one of the three um, programs, paint, mattresses and carpet that's doing has been doing very well. They, uh, I think they have at least 11 to 13 other states now that are running paint, paint care programs. So they're doing a great job uh, rolling this out and the majority of the paint is getting collected the waste paint is getting collected and recycled. Next slide. Carpet is another one of those program programs. Right now, the fee we pay, when you buy a buy new carpet, you're gonna pay 35 cents a square yard at the point of sale. Um, with some legislation that was passed last year, uh, there's now a requirement for differential fees. Um, so basically what we've done is we, there's equal eco-modulated fees or uh, differential fees that will require, it requires CARE, the stewardship organization organization running the carpet program to go back to the manufacturers and uh, figure out how much it's costing to, and the recyclers to figure out how much it's costing to recycle carpet and then change the fee at the point of sale or charge back to the, um, to the uh, manufacturers is likely it's gonna just be a differential fee at the point of sale. But what it will do is it'll inform um, customers or consumers, when they're buying cheap carpet that's expensive to recycle, they're gonna see that differential, that different fee. It won't be that 35 cents a square yard. It could be a dollar, two dollars a square yard. So uh, they have their care is required to come up with that differential fee and pr propose that to Cal Recycle. So we're looking forward to seeing that come forward. Um, care will provide a uh, free container uh, for you to use and provide transportation and recycling of the carpet. They are looking for more carpet. Apparently there's quite a demand for um, used carpet by uh, downstream industry. And so if you don't have a care trailer or a care uh, roll off box uh, at your covered roll off box at your location, you might wanna contact care and see if they you can get signed up in their program and start diverting the carpet 
rather than sending it into landfill. And by the way, you can still charge a tipping fee for uh, carpet at your gate um, when you take this stuff, and even if you are using the CARE program. Next slide. Mattresses, um, here we're paying a 1050 a unit. So if you get a king size set, you're gonna have three units. It's the mattress and the two box springs. You're gonna pay 3150 at the check stand to have your mattresses recycled, uh, the old mattresses recycled. And so this is funding that program. Um, I think they did about 1.5 million mattresses last year. It could be 1.7 million. Um, so the Mattress Recycling Council is running this program. Um, here, you can be a facility that collects mattresses. If you're part of the program, if you sign up to be part of the Bye Bye Mattress program, uh, you can get reimbursed by the Mattress Recycling Council for your labor to load, to collect and load the trailers um, that they will provide for you. Uh, but you cannot charge a tipping fee. You have to bring the mattresses in for free. So um, that's a little bit of a difference between uh, the carpet program and the uh, mattress program is whether you can charge for the tipping fee or not. But again, for the carpet program, they're not reimbursing you to load the trailers or load the um, roll-off boxes. So you're incurring that cost. So it kind of washes out one way or the other. Next slide. Okay, so I just want to summarize real quick and then we're going to move on to questions and then Joanne's presentation. So for batteries, only rechargeables are covered right now. We need to get these other chemistries funded so that uh, this the cost burden on local governments is taken care of and so uh, and those who are making these things or at least those who are using them are, are paying for the cost of end of life for meds and sharps as i mentioned that mentioned it's rolling out in 2022 uh, there may be need for some tweaks but we won't know that until we see the program rolling out and see where there might be some holes uh, it could be a, a potential regulatory fix or legislative fix, depending on what kind of holes we see in the program. But uh, for now, it looks great. The reg regulations came out really good. Um, beverage containers, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's been calls for a significant overhaul of that program. So watch for any legislation. I know that uh, Senator Wykowski just uh, brought, dropped in uh, a, uh, SB 38, which was his SB uh, 372 from last year, which was a comprehensive beverage container uh, overhaul of, of the system. And so watch for that one as it's rolling out. And there's other discussions both in the Capitol and, the, and in, the, uh, uh, in the governor's office about what to do with this program and how to fix it. Um, tire program. So here again, uh, the biggest issue I can see with this one is you've got a recycling fee that shows up on the uh, receipt, but then you also have a disposal fee. And I heard a lot of times complaints about or confusion about, well, wait a minute, I'm paying a recycling fee and then they're telling me I'm paying a disposal fee too. So there probably needs to be something done on this to kind of eliminate that confusion because for the public right now, they just don't get it. <laughs> Why are they paying a recycling fee and a disposal fee? So uh, there could be some work that's needed on the tire program. Uh, the e-waste program, again, it's just that the monitors are covered. So we got a lot of other products out there that are not being covered. And so, that, again, that's why that's one of the items that uh, CPSC is looking at with one of our potential bills. So there'll be more to come on that as we work through the process. Then paint, like I mentioned, that one's working pretty good. The biggest issue here is there's no requirement for participation. And therefore, the big box stores, your Home Depots, Walmarts, uh and lowe's have chosen not to participate they don't offer take back of paint and so it's been left to the hhw facilities and the smaller retailers like the uh dunn williams uh uh and benjamin moore and those types to have to take these things in so look there that is another one where uh potentially there's a hole there because the big box stores aren't required to participate for carpet biggest problem i see here is we've got about a 24% recycling rate, uh, according to the last reports from uh, from CARE. And that is taking up nearly 100% of the current 35 cents per square yard that's being funded. So if this program were to go to 50% or even to 100%, um, the 35 cents is not gonna cut it. So what does that consumer fee have to be in order to cover the true cost of the whole program? And what can the market bear uh, for competitiveness when you can when you're raising the consumer fees I know the carpet industry's concern is that the, the 35 cents is causing them market disruption and uh, unfair competitive advantage for the 
uh, uh, hardwoods or the hard floors, hard surface floors, such as uh, luxury vinyl tile, uh, which is one of the newer products out there that is competing with them on a, a dollar for dollar level for the cheaper, their cheaper carpet, the uh, polypropylene or, or poly, uh, the PET carpet. So uh, that's that's an issue that's out there that needs to be still needed to be looked at. And then finally, mattresses is working working pretty well. Um, illegal dumping is still a problem, and that's primarily because if a facility is not taking is not participating because they can make more money um, by receiving the mattress, charging a tipping fee for the mattress, say forty dollars per mattress, because they might be the only game in town. Um, why would they give up the sheer profit of maybe thirty dollars per mattress to accept two or three dollars per mattress for uh, handling costs? from the MRC. So that's a big challenge to get facilities to be willing to not use their, uh, lose their, they don't want to lose their profits in order to accept the mattresses for free. So we see, we tend to see more illegal dumping of mattresses in those areas than in the areas where the facilities have stepped up and said, okay, we're, we're happy to take the cost to handle and accept the mattresses for free. Next slide. Okay, so with that, um, I, I don't know if we want to take a couple questions now, Christine, or maybe we want to jump into um, jump into Joanne's pers her presentation since we're down to about 19 minutes left of the of the webinar. Sure, we just had uh, one question come in from Tanya Torres, um, which I'll ask you, and then maybe we can move on to Joanne so we can make sure she can get through. Um, are there any educational campaigns associated with these efforts to inform consumers that these recycling programs exist and how to participate? Yes, uh, great question. And so each um, product stewardship program, or at least the, the ones that are guided by law, require an education component. So um, like for mattresses, for a long time, you saw a lot of billboards, radio ads, TV ads. That's all that kind of stewardship. Um, that's all part of that public ed program. They also um, are required to reach out to uh, the retailers, to reach out to the um, recyclers, let them know that the program exists. Uh, so there's a lot that goes on there. Um, Carpet does a fairly good job of reaching out as well. Paint Paint Care um, did great jobs early on. Uh, there's, I haven't seen quite as much because that program is pretty well known, uh, but they still have a public ed requirement that they need to fulfill. So absolutely, the programs are do have those requirements for public ed. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to each one of those organizations and go to their websites because um, all of them have their public ed pieces on their websites as far as I know. And so you can learn more from them or get in contact with the program operators. Awesome. Um, and then we had one other question from Ruth um, uh, on uh, whether or not CPSC, Ruth Abbey, who's part of our webinar committee, um, is is CPSC involved in the bottle bill discussion? And I'm sure that could be a long answer, but I'm going <laughs> to keep you short so that we can get to Joanne. The, the short answer is yes. And to the level that I could explain, I can't tell you that, that right now, but yes, CPSC is involved. Okay, very short, perfect. Um, all right, and I, so I think we're gonna pass it over to Joanne now to start her presentation. Please. And then we can ask questions at the end. All right. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Perfect. Great, so my name is Dr. Joanne Brash. I'm a special project manager for CPSC. And I lead on two active grants, well, three if you count Stop Waste, and a couple former solar panel projects um, here at CPSC that have contributed to the data and information that I'll be presenting today. Um, so we'll talk about some of the regulations and the situation and how we can collect panels today and how we can collect panels after January 1st. We'll talk about the projects that we have at CPSC. Two of them are funded by Cal Recycle, so thank you so much. I do see some of our grant staff here on the webinar, so welcome and thank you. And we also have some special funded projects. And I do see Sloan on, so again, welcome and thank you. 
And the results of these projects have given us some good data and some market research results. I will try to breeze through the first set of slides because some of this information has been published. Over the summer, CPSC presented um, and published a paper with the Photovoltaic Specialist Conference. So that article is available on our website. Um, so the problem of solar panels, often classified as an emerging product, hard to manage product, uh, we do see it as a growing waste stream over the next, uh, rapidly over the next upcoming years. Typically, the industry claims 20 to 30 years of use per model, but uh, we are seeing them coming through the waste stream at a much lesser use, lesser years before end of life. Currently, right now, uh, the way the program is, there is actually no program. There's no plan, there's no funding for photovoltaics and sol solar panels. Uh, but we do see them coming off the roofs. We do see them coming through the local government. For example, Santa Monica, here's an example of a restaurant right near the beach. And as part of an upgrade to their roof, they decided they also wanted to upgrade their solar panels. So an entire roof's worth of working panels. And Santa Monica as a city had to try and work with them and try to help find a best use. For these panels. Here in Butte County is an example of a solar panel where they do not take solar panels at Butte County. Uh, the resident was not happy with that response, folded it up and shoved it in the e-waste bin. So again, in, in a pursuit of compliance, they had to take it out of the e-waste bin and process it on an HHW hazardous waste manifest. In Marin County, here's an example of an installer who has several panels that are uh, not planning to be installed, but they are awaiting proper recycling and proper management. If they were to be processed today, they would have to be processed as household hazardous waste in compliance with the DTSC, which is the Department of Toxic Substance Control. There's a few local jurisdictions in California that have programs. For example, Yolo County has one. But again, since we cannot process them as for, for, for recycling, unless they have been certified as non-hazardous, that certification, that test can cost upwards of $700. So again, uh, the economics just aren't there. So if they are processed as HHW, um, they're often landfilled in Nevada or a class, I believe class three landfill. <laughs> but either way, uh, talking about the environmental justice issues with that, um, we don't want to be putting solar panels into landfills when the whole goal of them are renewable resources and sustainable energy use. The regulations here in California, um, they are finally get catching up to the original passage of SB 489 in 2015. This was a bill by Monning that basically directed DTSC to reclassify solar panels from household hazardous waste into universal waste. Here we are in 2020, and the most recent update is that the regulations have been approved by the Office of Administrative Law, and they are set to go into effect January 1st, 2021. Again, uh, just because these regulations are in effect does not mean we can start collecting January 1st. Part of these regulations and the package did include notifying DTSC within 30 days of your intent to collect. So we know the notifications can start January, but in order for recyclers and local governments to become fully compliant, we recommend that they contact and read the regulations package on the DTSC website. So CPSC is working on several solar grants. On the left side of the screen, you can see the ones that are funded by CalRecycle. These are pilot projects. These are the first state-funded solar panel collection and recycling projects. 
On the right side, you see some of our other grant partners from Alameda Stock Waste and the County of San Mateo, also funding research and other solar projects um, to expand what we were learning with the Cal Recycle projects. The Cal Recycle projects uh, included installer interviews and resident surveys, and it was an online survey. And then we replicated the same surveys in San Mateo. So here you can see three jurisdictions and we see that there is an increasing uh, claim that they will plan to install solar panels in the next five years. We know that this number is actually gonna rise because of the California Energy Commission's rule to any new housing in California needs to have solar panels. Although that rule has been lax because of COVID, uh, we do expect it to ramp up and likely the result will be an influx of cheap, low cost solar panels that are installed just to meet that requirement, but could have long term waste management issues. We, ins we re uh, surveyed the residents. Um, so again, you can see average year of installation um, and they really do, mo the majority of the respondents think that responsible disposal is important. And so as we dug into what they believed, what is responsible recycling for solar panels? Where should the information come from? They really felt that the county and the installer themselves should be the source of information. As we did phone interviews with installers uh, throughout the three jurisdictions, we found that 86% of the interviewed installers do not have a policy or a process for advising on end of life. Um, when we started to actually look into how they are managed, we found that a lot of the working panels are currently involved in a reuse economy. So they are finding opportunities for donating the panels, for repurposing the panels. And in this research, we did have a great opportunity to find some great uses like uh, the, you can see the scooter, furniture. Most of the reported reasons that a resident wouldn't want their solar system any longer, um, you can see here in the infographic, but it still wasn't really clear what the rules and opportunities were for donation and reuse when recycling is not an option. And so we asked both residents and installers, how could we improve recycling locally? And a lot of it was tied to not only access to information and convenient drop-off locations, but again, this theme of reuse and donation was a theme that came up for both residents and our installers. Our installers clearly indicated a need to partner with the manufacturers, the distributors, the network and supply chain where they are accessing these solar panels was perceived to be the best uh, system for reverse logistics. So we asked our residents if they would support a solar panel recycling program that was funded by producers. And 64% of the respondents did say yes. And as you can see in this graphic are uh, the reasons that they would support this producer funded program is similar to some of the things we've talked about previously. Um, it's convenient, it should be already tied to the product and there's already programs for other products. And so it would be expected for other hard to manage products to have similar product programs. So with the upcoming DTSC regs being fully implemented and finding recyclers that are fully compliant, CPSC will be managing two collection events, one in Butte County, one in the city of Santa Monica, we are aiming for late spring, early summer, as homeowners are considering uh, maybe investing in home upgrades and looking for an opportunity to find an outlet for those panels. But what's key for us is to really find uh, reuse before recycling. 
So what we often encourage our network and attendees of these presentations is to really invest in panels that are durable, that don't have hazardous components. We want to encourage repair opportunities and invest in those types of businesses who are looking to repair and get these panels back into the regional market. Donation is always a good use. We've called several Habitat for Humanities and confirmed if they are working, they will accept solar panels. Um, so looking into other donation opportunities locally and joining CPSC. So as a result of the Stop Waste Grant, we have been res um, researching what the rules and regulations are for solar panel reuse. The Solar Panel Industry Association does plan on putting out guidelines for solar panel reuse hopefully early 2021, which will help guide local government in California to develop a plan that optimizes solar panel management for best use. Uh, if anyone's interested in our collection events, if you know any installers or anyone in Santa Monica or Butte, we encourage you to contact CPSC, get on our list so you can participate in this free collection event. So with that, I will open it up to questions. All right, and I think we'll take questions for both Doug and Joanne. Um, but we have a question here. What would it take on what would be the path forward to make the manufacturers responsible for the life of the product? I'm not sure if that's specific to Joanne's presentation. Joanne, why don't you yeah, start with solar, and I'll take it from there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say with solar, there's one or two companies out there who are doing voluntary action. So that voluntary product stewardship where they choose to in, implement a program. But ultimately, if you wanted to get the entire industry to engage in a program and to uh, design a, a product that is easier to manage, then legislation would be required. Yeah, and to, to compliment on that, so um, we're seeing more and more of the industries deciding, wait a minute, we, we have these sustainability goals, we want to look green, um, and so we're starting to see a little less resistance to these kind of programs. Um, they're also figuring out that the sooner they get in and start negotiating with us, the better position they're going to be in, um, because if they're going to be resistant, as pharmaceutical industry was for many years, um, when they finally came to the table, they weren't necessarily happy with the program they're now, they've inherited. It's great for the consumers and it should have been done a long time ago. Um, so, but that took, in, in order to get the pharmaceutical industry to the table, we had to get um, a lot of local jurisdictions. So we actually had um, 10 jurisdictions sign uh, or pass ordinances for local requirements for EPR for uh, pharmaceuticals. And, there were more on the way, and that drove the industry to the table to say, wait a minute, we want a statewide solution. We don't want 58 different kinds of programs we have to run in this state. And so what it would take if we get a industry that's kind of recalcitrant and doesn't want to do anything but just make money, um, we can, if we can't get it through at the state level, then we can always go back to the local level and start passing these local ordinances and nickel and dime them and needle them until, until they come to the table and say, okay, we want a statewide program. And so um, that's that's kind of what it takes. It depends on the industry and how willing they are to, to help out. I know that in my work with the solar industry, um, they realize they have to do something. The problem is they're competing with fossil fuels right now on a, a penny by penny basis. And so for them, it's difficult to embed this, to absorb this cost of recycling of these panels. Um, and so they are, they're a little resistant right now, but they do realize that they're going to have to do something. So they are already coming to the table and talking about it. And so that's why you haven't seen us introduce any EPR legislation for solar panels. Hopefully that answers that question. Now, I had a question just in the last minute or so that we have. Um, uh, if other folks want to ask questions, we're happy to keep things open um, for a couple of minutes if Doug and Joanne um, can do that. Um, but how, you know, um, what are the characteristics of a product that you look for when you're deciding, you know, this product would be appropriate for um, product stewardship or an extended producer responsibility framework? 
That's a great question, Christine. So here's here's how we kind of look at it. We look we we do a product by product base approach. Um, first, how much of a management problem and how much of a management cost is it for our local governments? Because uh, we try to if we help the local governments, we're helping a lot of other folks too to get this cost burden off of them. And so uh, there are products out there that without a doubt, EPR will work. We can go to the man, we can identify the manufacturers, hold them accountable for their products. They, they'll they likely do a better job of designing them. Um, and so we target those particular manufacturers uh, of those that product category first under EPR, always figuring we may have to fall back to more of a product stewardship role and maybe a visible fee. Um, then there are other products that there is just, there's just, it's not going to work for an EPR that program. There's just, there's, we know that it's dead on arrival. Um, we, we start, we start to talk about it and then we're going to, we know we're going to fall back almost immediately to something more like a consumer fee. So mattresses, carpet, paint, those were pretty, pretty good indicators that those were, we didn't introduce those bills. We've come back and clean, done cleanup legislation on a few of them. Um, but those were going to be more difficult. It's kind of like trying to get the producers to take responsibility for batteries. It's going to be a challenge. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of, uh, do you hold the retailers responsible or do you hold the manufacturers responsible? Retailers, they're just about every retail outlet sells batteries. So that would be very difficult to roll them all in. So that makes consumer fee very difficult. So that's why we definitely want our EPR, true EPR approach for batteries so that we don't end up with another bottle bill program where we're wrestling year over year to make it successful. Um, let's get the producers to run that program. They'll figure out how to make it run right. There are plenty of examples of how it's running already in other countries. And so why can't we do it here? So, um, and then when I mentioned something like the the e-waste, which we're gonna roll in with large appliances, small appliances and power tools, that particular product, those product categories we chose we're more about the illegal dumping and the waste of resources for the appliances. There's a big need to get these appliances diverted um, because either they're getting illegally dumped, which is a major cost burden on behalf of the local governments, um, or they're just not being properly uh, recycled. We're still seeing them disposed of in landfills. Um, so we want to see that pro those product categories get truly recycled and recycled properly. And so that one do we go here do we go with a true epr approach can we rope all those folks in get them all paid into the program or are we going to look more kind of like a visible fee and so that's what we're starting to wrestle with already on that is which direction do we go so it's a it's a dance and that has to be done and it's is it going to get through politically i mean we can push very hard for really high bar pro programs and we like to do that but if it's not going to get through politically and it's going to just kill the build we need to be able to compromise and come down and meet somewhere in the middle to make sure the program is effective and and cost effective for the consumers. Thanks, that's, that's helpful. Um, I think that we had some other questions um, uh, and Joanne indicated that um, CPSC is um, working to put together a list of uh, companies in California and elsewhere that are currently recycling and reprocessing solar panels um, and offered that folks can reach out to her on that. Her email's in the chat. Um, and then we had one other question. Yeah, I see, I see Jose's well, question. <laughs> the, the list that we're building are just relative, close to Butte or close to Santa Monica. So it's not a statewide list, so I will say that. Yeah, then let me, I'll go ahead and tackle Jose's question. I do have an update for him on the labeling. So Jose, you're right. We introduced uh, SB 1152 um, last legislative session to try and get uh, a labeling standard requirement put on to solar panels so that when the facilities get these at the end of life, whether it be at solid waste facilities, household hazardous waste facilities, or at the e-waste processing facilities, they knew what they were dealing with because you have two types. You have the, the hazardous thin film type and you have the crystalline non as this type and how how do you tell the difference and so um i compliment the solar industry for stepping up uh they didn't want to be pushed into a corner and made to do labeling uh, they knew they needed to do it and so we've been working closely with the solar industry over the last year um and they are right now just about they're ready to i believe to take a vote through the ul process to um, have that as a requirement of ul listing uh to label 
your their product with the type of panel it is. Um, I believe there's still a little bit of nuance whether it'll be listed as thin film or do they really say like it's cadmium telluride, a specific type of thin film. Um, so, but we we know that they will be at a minimum it will be thin film, uh, crystalline, so that the facilities will know when they look at a panel that comes in, they'll know what type they're dealing with so they don't have to go look it up on the list. Hope One, hope there's a label there. Two, hope that the label <laughs> has the manufacturer and the product number on it so they can go to a big long long list from CEC maintains and determine what kind of panel they have in front of them. So we're trying to make this as easy as possible. And I do credit the solar industry from for stepping up and being willing to take that on uh, on their own. Well, just wanted to say again, thank you to Joanne and Doug for joining us. Um, we are going to post um, the recording of this presentation, a copy of Doug and Joanne's presentation um, on the uh, Swana NorCal events page, um, which I'll send out to everybody in the chat again. Um, sent it out a little bit earlier at the beginning of the meeting. Um, and so you can see that there um, and you can share it with colleagues um, and uh, join us for future presentations. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, guys. Thank you.